sad news for us. We just found out that Alice passed away this morning. And literally just found out. You know, that song could have come at a better time because what fit Alice better than I have decided to follow Jesus? To the very end, she made that choice. So let's sing this again, thinking of Alice in our hearts. And let's, let's pray also, Lord. It is a sad day when we lose a loved one, but it's also a glorious day for them. Yes, Lord, we lift up uh, Brenda and Mark and Bonnie and uh, the, the whole family over there and friends. And they have a lot of friends and family, Lord. Because Alice is such a powerhouse for the kingdom. Yes. And I'm sure the Lord is saying to her right now, well done, good and faithful servant. Come in to the rest of the kingdom. Just bring comfort, Father God, and I'm sure we'll be in service and we'll be able to share more about her at the service, Lord. But just keep us, keep her in our hearts, and Lord, just let us keep praying for this family. But let's sing this song together again with Alice in our mind as somebody who finished the race. And let us do the same thing with the same courage and the same fervor as our sister Alice. In Jesus' name.
Instead of greeting each other like normal, let's just comfort each other right now. Go ahead and be released to comfort each other. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So this is my last test with this microphone. If it doesn't work, duck. I'm going to throw it way <laughs> down there. <laughs> it's hard to, to preach when you have wires on your feet and stuff. And, but, you know, I have that one just in case. So we'll see what happens today. Um, again, it is a sad day when we lose a loved one. We were just out there not too long ago. And, a couple of the guys went out there and helped move her bed and couch around and stuff. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't think she was going to go that quickly. She looked okay to us. But God has his timing. And now think about it. That's, that's the hope that we have of heaven. Knowing that when that time comes for us, it's just going to be glorious. Amen. Well, I don't know who's gonna give me a hard time anymore. Maybe one of you guys will take Alice's spot. <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she kept me in check. That's for sure. I mean, there's no doubt about it. She came from a ministry family, 
you know, so she wasn't afraid of pastors. She wasn't afraid of anything. Her, her husband was a pastor. And so, yeah, but, you know, the beautiful part about it, you know, she always came up to you and say, great sermon. I love the word of God. You know, she was really encouraging, you know. But at the same time, you know, don't mess up. <laughs> but you know what? She did it with love and grace, and I'm going to miss her, that's for sure. We're all going to miss her. Um, we're, oh, let's talk about a few announcements before we get started the sermon. We are going to have a Good Friday service here. Is this thing off or on? It's on. It's on? Yes. Okay. Can you raise it a little bit, Francis? Uh, so Good Friday uh, will be at 7 p.m. on Good Friday. We'll have a service with the Lutheran Church. We're going to have a combined service. So please uh, make a note of that. And uh, Selena and the team will have a, a worship set and all that stuff. So, um, And then we're going to have Easter Sunday here as normal time. We will have a children's uh, church that morning. So if you have any kids you want to bring along, feel free to bring them along on Easter. It's going to be fun. And then uh, further ahead on Mother's Day, we have a guest speaker coming in, one of my good friends from San Diego, a uh, wonderful, wonderful woman. Her name is Vicki Har, H-A-R-R. -R. She has a few books on a uh, wonderful subject if you want to look her up, but yeah, she's going to be a blessing to us on Mother's Day. So, well, let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. And Lord, we just want to give the rest of the service to you uh, in honor of Alice, and let's just do church the way <laughs> she wanted it to be done, Lord. And uh, hope we can make her proud today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, can you think of the time when you first received Christ? You remember a moment? Do you remember that moment that changed your life forever? The moment you experienced love like you never had before. The moment you experienced joy unspeakable before glory. The moment where the peace of God came into your life. The moment when all of our burdens that we had our whole lives was placed on the shoulders of Jesus. That's when we became Christians. That's what happened. I'm going to throw this thing. <laughs> all right. We tried. We still got to work out some kinks in this building, so... Uh, that's one of them. I don't know why the Lutheran Church, their microphone, the exact same microphone, works. <laughs> and, and ours doesn't. I don't know. Anyway, so it is what it is. Do you remember what led up circumstantially before you received Christ? What I'm saying is that before we received Christ, did something happen to you? Was there a circumstance, something happened in your life that led you to receive Christ? Did you feel like you were missing something? Something was missing in my life. Something was empty in my heart. I don't know what it is. And you realized it was Jesus. Sometimes there are people who think that they are right with God, but they're not right with God. And that's when we're looking at the story of Saul today in our text. That's found in, if you're at home, Acts chapter 9. Verses 1 through 9 today. He's going to have his experience today of salvation like we did. But God had a different plan for Saul, who became who? Paul. Paul, the apostle who wrote most of the New Testament. The guy we're reading about today, he was a hater of Christians. He was getting Christians arrested. He was bringing them before the Sanhedrin, the high court. This dude was a bad dude. But God said, I have other plans for this dude. We're going to look at that today. All right, so Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. He asked for letters from them to the synagogues of Damascus. So if anyone were found of the way, that Jesus one way, right? Whether men or women, he must bring them bound to Jerusalem. He's going to arrest the Christians. As they journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone, shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
And he said, Saul said, think of his voice, who are you, Lord? <laughs> He's not like, that. what's going on? No, he got thrown on the ground. Big old light came. He's like, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he said, trembling, astonished, astonished, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and you will be told you must what you must do. And verse 7, And the men who journeyed with them stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and his eyes were open. He saw no one. He was blind. The Lord blinded him. And they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. These were Abraham's right? By the way, there's a controversy with this, this scripture about if Paul was knocked off his horse. So many people at children's church, and you know, Paul was going down, he got knocked off his horse. Do you see a horse in here? <laughs> no, it's not in here. But there's an assumption that he was probably riding on a horse or donkey or something. But So most pictures you see of this, he's like getting knocked off a horse. But my first day in Bible college, they said that's not true. So I thought I'd throw that out there and kind of blow your mind. But I blew my mind when I heard that. I've always said you fell off a horse. You just, you ever heard that? Okay. You probably did fall off a horse, little donkey. I don't know. But the title of today's message is Church Persecutor to Preacher. Church Persecutor to Preacher. We should have a slide somewhere around here. Well, she's working on that. So, church persecutor to preacher. All right. Number one. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Okay. I'm not going to worry about that. See, if it works, it works. It doesn't. It doesn't. You guys have a sheet in front of you. Oh, my Lord. In verse 5, Saul says, there he goes, church persecutor to preach. Good job, Sarah. Um, in verse 5, the, the, and he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord says, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. So number one is, oh, my Lord. You know what? I don't think people call me Jesus. I run into this thing, sorry. You know, Saul thought he was doing God's work. He thought, hey, these bad Christians of the way, they're fooling people, they're 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 doing adultery. I'm gonna go and say and Paul or Saul was part of the Sanhedrin, which was part of the high court of the Jews back then, and he was also a Pharisee, one of the religious leaders. So, so he had the authority to ask the high priest to go arrest these people. And that's what he did. So he went thinking he was doing good, but it was actually against God. Now there was a woman waiting at the airport. She had a few, so, you ever go to the airport early, you have to wait for your flight, right? She was there, and she, like most of us get bored at the airport, we go to the shops, we go to the, get a candy bar or a soda, whatever. She goes to a shop, she gets herself uh, a book to read, and she also got herself uh, some cookies, a bag of cookies. So she's uh, she goes sits down, and she noticed, like in the side of her eye, somebody was eating cookies. She's like, this guy's eating my cookies. What's this guy doing? He's why's he eating my cookies? And she she didn't know. She kind of froze. She didn't know what to do. What do I do? Punch the guy? What do I do? He's eating my cookies. So. As it keeps going on, she grabs a cookie, he grabs a cookie, she grabs a cookie, and she didn't know what to do. This guy was just friendly, just smiling away. The cookie thing, she's thinking, man, what a jerk. So, there was one cookie left. And what happened was, the man grabbed the last cookie. And she, she was just fuming. And she said, she looked at him kind of mean. He cracked, he made it half. The cookie, you ever have to cookie? 
She grabbed the cookie and said, and ran and walked away. And her flight was being boarded. She gets on on the board. On, she gets on a plane. She's really angry. She sits down. Just oh, how could this man eat my cookies? She sits down. She says, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the rest of my book. She opens her purse and there's her cookies. <laughs> This guy was sharing his cookies with her. She was a cookie thief. And he was being nice by sharing his cookies with her. Just like Paul here, he's doing something he thinks is right, but he's actually wrong. Amen? We got some cookies. Now. There's some good brownies I saw in the kitchen by the valley mates. We're going to eat those brownies in a little bit. <laughs> Think about something. So you're, you think you're doing God's work, and Jesus says to you, you're not doing God's work. Wouldn't that be a shock? Total shock. And I, get, I guarantee you, Saul at this point was shocked. Really, really shocked. And it says that he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I thought it was interesting about this is that he's persecuting the church, right? He's going after the church. He's arresting church people, us, people. But Jesus says, Saul, Saul, you're persecuting me. What? He didn't say, you know, you're messing with my people. He says, you're messing with me. Think about that. <laughs> Did anyone have a big brother growing up? It was kind of cool because if you, someone's messing with you, you call your big brother. And the big brother goes and wipes someone out. Right? My brother, I should show you some pictures of Rome. He's not here, thank God, I can talk about it. Uh, I don't think he watches us online. But in high school, I don't know why he grew his hair out. It was bleach, blonde. He, you can't even see, he's like a shepherd dog. Yeah, you can't even see his eyes. He's like all like this. That guy looked crazy. He looked completely crazy. So people heard that was my brother. They didn't want to mess with me. <laughs> I got to put some pictures. Next time we'll put a picture up here. He's going to kill me. Uh, <laughs> and actually, his science teacher used to call him Roman the Lion. Because his, mane, his hair was all like, anyway. <laughs> so when you mess with God's people, you're messing with Think about that. Wow. And it says in Colossians, it might be in your sheet, Colossians 1, 17 and 18a. He existed before everything. He holds all creation together. Christ is also the what? The head of the church and we are the body. If you're looking for this illustration, like he's the head of the church and we are his body. That's what the Bible teaches. Like he's in charge. This is his church. And we're not talking about these walls of this church. Wherever we go, that's where the church is. It's nice to have people come to a church which is very healthy in the Christian walk. But wherever you and I walk, the church is there. Amen? Right. Ephesians 2.20 And we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. The foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. The foundation of our faith is not people. So many people follow leaders. And then you hear the same thing over and over again. I keep seeing people follow leaders and they don't follow Jesus. And that's what happens. Jesus has to be the foundation of our faith and it can't be people. Amen? Because people will bring you down. People will disappoint you. That's for sure. So we are the church. The church is not a building. It's Christ's followers everywhere with Jesus as our leader and our foundation. Amen, somebody. Amen. So number one was, oh my Lord. <laughs> he says, Jesus says, um, you're persecuting me, man. So Paul said, oh my Lord. Number two is, oh my God. Oh my God. G-O-A-D. Oh my God. You get it? Oh my God. Oh my God. Never mind. I was trying to be silly, but oh my God. It says here in verse 5, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. What's a goad? What the heck is that, a goat? What is this, goad? 
Well, it's basically this. Back then, you know, they would have oxen and they would try to keep them, and they would plow the fields. They're trying to keep the line straight on the field. And so the, the person who's behind the oxen would have a, lo a long stick that's considered a goad. And so whenever the oxen would start going this way, he'd poke him in the shoulder with like a sharp stick or sometimes a metal edge to it, and then he would kind of go back online. He starts going this way, he pokes him with the stick again, he goes back straight. That's a goad. Understand? So that's what Jesus is saying to Saul. You're kicking against the goad. And what would happen was when there was a rebellious oxen, that you know, he would you ever seen a horse or some an animal be rebellious, they kick, they kick back like that, they kick. Well, when the oxen became rebellious, the person who has the, 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 the goad would stick it down by his like his thighs. And so when the, the the ox would kick, he would hurt himself. So you're kicking against the goad, meaning that you're being stubborn. That's what it means. You're kicking against the goads. Oh my goad, don't kick against the goads. Some of your translations may not even have that verse in there. And some translations do, some translations don't. But in, later on in Acts, he says it again. So I think it's, it's meant to be here. Don't kick against the goads. So, <clears throat> someone interpret the goad meaning your conscience. Basically, like, before you become a Christian, remember earlier I said that sometimes when you, before you're a Christian, God starts having circumstances go on in your life and you end up submitting to Christ? This is very similar. You remember a guy named Stephen we talked about a few weeks ago? Remember he was murdered and he was the first Christian martyr for church? Well, who was there? It said that someone was there. It was Saul. It said that they put their coats down by a young man named Saul. So he was all for killing Stephen. He was down for it. And it says here that his conscience is being pricked. That's what Jesus is doing to him. What caused his conscience to hurt? Well, maybe it was Stephen. Think about that. Stephen, so Saul was present when Stephen was murdered. He was just standing there watching them kill Stephen. You remember the Bible said that Stephen's face shined like an angel? He saw that. He saw that Stephen didn't run. He was courageous and, and took, took it. He heard the sermon that Stephen gave about Jesus being the Messiah. He heard Stephen's prayer that said, Lord, forgive them. Like Jesus, remember he said, Lord, forgive them. And then it was Saul standing there, Saul, Stephen saying, I see the heavens open up. And I see Jesus standing. Remember that? And that's when they went crazy. Remember that? They started going, Aah! They started stoning him. Remember that? Well, he was there for all of that. Saw, saw all that go down. And his conscience was being pricked by the goat. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's happening right here. He was in internal turmoil. Ever been in internal turmoil? Before I, I came to Christ, I couldn't. I didn't have peace in my life. I didn't have any peace in my life whatsoever. I had internal turmoil because God was trying to get my attention. Can you relate to that? C.S. Lewis put it this way. I became aware that I was holding something at bay. He was talking about before I became a Christian or shutting something out. Or if you like, I was wearing some stiff clothing or even a suit of armor. If I were a lobster, he's saying I was like a lobster, I was a hard shell. I felt myself being there and then, giving her free choice. I could open the door or keep it shut. I could unbuckle the armor or keep it on. He's saying that everyone has a choice. When you start feeling the Lord calling you in circumstances, calling the unbeliever, you start feeling those things, you start feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He says everyone has an option to take off the armor, to take off the shell, if you will. Everyone has an option. Everyone has a choice. On your sheet it says everyone has a choice. Are they going to accept Christ? Maybe they're kicking against the goads. The more they kick, the more pain they cause themselves. Another, does anyone have anyone in your life that's kicking against the goads? 
that mean rebellious against Christ, who won't submit to Christ, and they're just kicking and kicking and kicking and hurting themselves, hurting themselves, and then eventually they hurt others. Right? I think you know what I'm talking about. Everyone has a choice. And pain is not always a bad thing. Sometimes people come to me and say, oh, my son, my daughter, are they doing this? They're in jail. I go, good. <laughs> they go, what are you talking about? Sometimes pain is not a bad thing for people. People have to pay for their sins and mistakes. We all do. It's those people who rescue every single person. They don't learn a lesson. They have to learn their lesson or else they're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. That's my philosophy anyway. <laughs> okay. So pain is not always a bad thing. On your sheet it says, C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to our conscience, but shouts in our pain. The more they kick, excuse me, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So pain's not always bad when someone's running from Jesus. What happened to Jonah? <laughs> he was lunch that day. So what do we do in our lives? We have people in our lives who are kicking against the goats. What do we do? What we do is be a witness like Stephen. Be a witness. Be a witness to your family. You don't always have to preach to your family and friends. Your life shows God's goodness. Amen? Amen. Sometimes you have to say something. I understand that. But ultimately, our lives will express the goodness of God. When did we finally surrender to Jesus? What had to happen? Paul, remember, wrote a lot of the New Testament. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thank God he gives victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's Saul became an apostle, and he's saying, I went through all this pain, and the Lord pricked my conscience. He knocked me down. He did all these things, and... I thank God now that I have victory over sin. I thank God that when I die, I can go to heaven. That's what Paul's saying. He became a preacher, like the title of our sermon, church persecutor to preacher. Read, the, read all the, the epistles in the New Testament. Most of them are written by Paul. It's pretty cool to see what God did to a man who was called by God. Amen. Now, God did not give up on Saul, who was working behind the scenes. To prepare him to be the preacher man that he became. There's a story of a young lady, probably like, you know, 19, 20 years old. She had a run in with the law. She had a DUI. Driving on the influence. So her mom would just shut up with her. She just kept blowing it and blowing it and blowing it. And she finally went to the police station, bailed her out. And they, they didn't even talk on the way home. They're just silent with each other. You know what that is, right? You're silent. And you're mad, at, you're mad at them. After a few days, the mother walks up to the young lady, hands her a wrapped present, little wrapped present. And the, and the, and the young lady says, like, they know how they do. <laughs> and then she opens the present, and there's a rock in them. A rock! Like a coal, you know, like, like Christmas. No, you know, it was a rock. And she says, why are you giving me this? And she said, the mom said, read the card inside of there. And it says, this rock is more than 6,000 years old. That's how long it will take before I give up on it. God never gave up on us. God never gave up on Saul. Saul was going to kill Christians. Saul was, I mean, he was a bad dude. But God was working, working on his heart. Like he worked on our hearts. Amen? Amen. And you're here in church in 2023. What an awesome thing that we still serve Jesus. Amen? So number two was, oh my God. <laughs> Someone like that joke. Okay, that's good. If I get one last time, it's fine. So verse 6 says, So he, trembling and astonished, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. 
Number three is, oh Lord, what can I do for you? Oh Lord, what can I do for you? It's up on the screen too. Oh Lord, what can I do for you? So he goes to a situation where he's blinded, he gets knocked down, and he finds out that Jesus is true. And then what does he say? What can I do? What do you want me to do? Isn't that cool? Isn't that what we did when we commit to Christ? We tell Jesus, what can we do for you? A saved, it's on your sheet, a saved life is a surrendered life. A saved life is a surrendered life. Sometimes God will knock us to our knees, like it says here. Sometimes God will knock us to our knees in order to, for us to stand up for Him. Sometimes God has to knock us down or else we're not going to be able to be strong enough to stand for Him. And before we can be free, we need to go through a season of breaking and God dealing with our pride. I went through that for a long time. God dealing with my pride. It was bad. My pride was really, really bad. But God had to break me down, break me down, drop me on my knees like that. Many times where I thought I had it, I thought I, I figured this whole thing out. I had nothing figured out. Only when I depended on the Lord with all my heart and all my mind and soul strength that my life was changed. Even as a believer, you can be a believer and still be a stubborn mule. <laughs> we can be believers and not be surrendered to Jesus all the way. We can be happy with fire insurance, but we're not all the way serving Jesus. And you thought I wasn't going to use a pig illustration again four weeks in a row? I'm going to use it again. The, the pig and the chicken. Remember that one? Same. I'm going to keep every week I'm using it. Finally, I'm going to put a big chicken up here or something. Like <laughs> But it's the same thing. It's the same thing over and over again because we need to be sacrificial and get rid of our pride. It's hard for men, especially. It was so hard for me to just let my guard down for the Lord. And the hardest thing for me was this. Lord, what do you want to do with my life? Like Saul says, Lord, what can I do? That was the hardest thing for me in the whole world because I didn't want to submit my heart all the way. Because I was okay being stubborn. <laughs> I was saying I'm living for Jesus but I was actually stubborn and hanging on to things okay, it. so then he has a little clock here for us now so, so that's good All right. speaking of pride Nowadays, pride is celebrated, right? Like, oh, I have money, I have a car, I have a beautiful whatever. Oh, have pride. Have all this pride and all the stuff that you have. But in the Bible, James 4, 6 say, it says that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. You want God to oppose us? Be proud. Not proud of your car or your home, but be proud spiritually. Like, I got this. I can, I can be saved without Jesus. I can do this in my good works. God opposes that. He does not humble. God opposes the proud. You, do, you want God's opposition in your life or you want God's grace? Okay, you want God's opposition? Raise your hand. You want God's grace? Raise your hand. Yes, we want God's grace in our life. We don't want God to oppose the proud. And I think I'm speaking mostly to the men here. It is very, very hard for us to be broken. Very hard. Trust me. When our pride is broken, go ahead and come up, Selena. When our pride is broken down, we are ready to say to Jesus, what do you want me to do? And some of us are afraid. I know some people say, if I give my, my whole life to Christ, He'll send me to Africa. He'll send me to Korea. He'll send me wherever. And so people don't give their lives 100% to the Lord. think God's going to call them somewhere crazy. But you know what? I think God just calls us here. At our jobs. In our families. It doesn't have to be some extravagant thing. Maybe it is some extravagant. But 
most of our world, the Bible says to go to the world and preach the gospel, most of the world is right around us. You don't have to go on the airplane. You can stay right here and do the Great Commission. So, as way of review, number one was, Oh my Lord. Number two was, Oh my God. Number three was, Oh Lord, what can I do for you? We're going to sing that same song again that... Um, Okay. I think we should go back to the song that we cut. Go ahead. Which is I Stand Wrong. All right. Maybe we can just speed. Well, they don't have to see me. That's fine. They know I'm here. <laughs> just the last thing that Pastor Eddie was talking about, like saying, God, what, what can I do for you? And that it takes a form of surrender to get to that place. So we have to surrender our lives in order to do that. And this song we actually cut, so it might not be on there, but we all know this song. So if we could please stand with us for this last song. And also in honor of Alice, who is loved when I added hymns. <laughs>
would be broken and that the goads that they're kicking against Lord would be too much and that they would surrender their lives to Jesus and help us be that person that they're going to look to when that happens as we lovingly witness to them in Jesus name we pray these things Amen see you guys next door